Hey everyone, Brian Beeler and Kevin O'Brien coming to you from the Storage Review Lab, and today we're doing a Twinsies review. Well, not quite Twinsies, I guess. Well, they were launched at the same time. They were they look very similar. Yeah, what's that called when the twins are come out at the same time but don't look the same? I don't know. It's I know there's identical con- twins. There's conjoined twins, but they're not. No, that's they're not, not this. attached to one another. No, so these are the twins that come out that don't look the same, but are launched or birthed at the same time. Uh, we've got the uh, MP600 Core and the MP600 Pro. So these are the latest SSDs from Corsair. They're both um, NVMe SSDs, but they're quite different in their componentry. Yeah, one's QLC, one's uh, TLC, and that's going to be more of a... One's good for uh, capacity, second-tier storage. The other one's more for your boot storage and primary storage. Right, and they're both Gen 4, so they're the latest interface, and they'll work on older systems that are Gen 3. Uh, but these being Gen 4 means that if you put them in currently uh, AMD systems that have uh, Gen 4 ports on board, uh, that you'll be able to get the best performance profile out of these drives. And uh, there are a number of those boards out there and more coming. And Intel should have support very, very, very soon uh, for Gen 4. So there's all sorts of opportunity to uh, get high speed or high capacity, lower cost drives out of these things. Um, Let's actually take a quick look at the specs and then come back and and talk about the design of these these drives if we can. Uh, So like we said, both uh, we're looking at the Pro and the Core in this family review and the core this is a two terabyte drive that we've reviewed it actually still has pretty decent endurance 450 uh, terabytes written it's not miserable no i i think the um endurance wasn't a big thing for the early drives it was more of a you'd write to it and if you wrote too much too quickly the drive performance would just fall off a cliff these drives uh not as much okay and then as we transition to, I mean, we can see the performance profile theoretically up to about 5,000 megabytes per second. As we take a look at the Pro, uh, just from an understanding where that levels out, now we're looking at uh, 7,000 megabytes per second, which is more or less the top of the interface. Yeah. Um, so as Kevin said before, this one uses TLC, the other one uses QLC, and you can see in that endurance rating now of 1,400 terabytes written that the... the um, difference is, is, what, three, almost four times at that point. Yeah, and the usability is going to be the big difference there. You can hammer the traditional drive in really any way you want to, and it's going to perform pretty well. The uh, QLC drive, uh, if you write too much to it or you're moving around a lot of data, game save, or well, not really game saves, but the entire game installation, you're probably going to slow down the drive dramatically. So you just have to watch out when moving around like many, many gigabytes of data at a time. Okay, so we've talked about the specs. Let's talk about the build a little bit. You've got this one sitting in this uh, PCI adapter card, but they both come with heat sinks clipped on. Yeah, and um, it's not that difficult to uh, take it apart. Um, there's, you don't really need much for, uh, much tools in general. We used a, a little uh, plastic uh, spudger, yes, and um, it's like a plastic pry bar, but. There are certain drives that we've seen where uh, the SSD is glued or uh, stickered into the bottom. This just has a, a normal uh, thermal pad. And the pad gets kind of mangled if you want to take it out, but you can take it out if you need to, which is important because we have uh, workstations, for example, which uh, include a uh, onboard heatsink assembly, and they're designed for just a bare M.2, not one in a cool case. Right. Uh, and in like the P620, for instance, where we uh, can test this in the uh, Threadripper Pro system from Lenovo, there's just no room. Yeah, they're, well, so they have their own heat spreader. But even if you take that off with a GPU in there or something, you just couldn't fit the thing. Oh yeah, and then there's the issue of uh, the heatsink makes it a little bit wider, and there when you're talking about a millimeter or two of space extra, you end up having the two drives hit one another instead of uh, going nicely against each other. So that's for workstations, but what if you want to pry this dude off and put it in a notebook? Um, well, that has the same thermal pad, so you can pop that off pretty easily. And uh, Do you trust me? Yeah. You don't do? <laughs> you normally don't. Kevin doesn't normally We've trust re- me to touch anything. That... We've already reviewed it, so I don't care anymore. Yeah. Okay. So it comes apart, and, and to Kevin's point, that's not even something that we thought we would be having a conversation about 
uh, until very recently when we've started to see some of these enthusiast drives come to market that have big heat sinks on them, but they're not always easy to remove. So something to consider if you're looking for this in a system where the board's a little tighter, or if you're gonna put it in even like a PCIe sled that might face a different direction and, and rub up against other uh, components in the system. And there are some vendors that offer two variants of the drive. Uh, West Angel, for example, they include the bare drive and they have one with the heat sink. So they give that option out there because they're assuming it's gonna go into OEM and retail markets. Right. But it wouldn't be out of the uh, realm to ask a vendor to offer a bare assembly versus one with the heat sink. Certainly, well, they probably OEM one, I would guess. And that SN850 uh, has a RGB heatsink available, so that's yes. extra special F F FPS for sure. Um, and if you don't like this heatsink and you need a batter heatsink, you can get a liquid cooled module. Yeah, they have a hydro version of this drive uh, that looked, I couldn't figure it out at first because I don't do water cooling, then I realized it was two uh, L's, a input and output. Uh, it It's interesting because m when you're talking about trying to shed heat in a system, most of the SSDs don't really throw off a lot of heat. A I don't lot think that's really the point, though, of liquid cooling your SSD. Probably not. You know what the point is. Well, yeah. I, I want to see some uh, UV reactive uh, liquid that has like a black light. You can kind of see uh, some glow in the dark. Uh, Are you doing like a CAT scan or something? You need to check out the old arteries? That'd be pretty uh, special. <laughs> we'll pick some of that up from the hospital. Anyway, so you can liquid cool it. Uh, that's a heat sink package that isn't necessarily tied to this drive. It would work on any drive. But uh, for people that have gone all in on Corsair, it's another neat thing visually, aesthetically, that you can put into the system. Uh, it's worth checking out. Yeah. Um, let's get to the performance real quick as we uh, we sort of bounced back and forth on the design. So you started with the uh, the core guy. Yeah, and it offers pretty strong performance on sequential read around three and a half uh, gigs a second, and it's going to perform pretty well when you keep it within the constraints of a QLC product. Okay. Uh, these tests, the reason why you don't, uh, don't compare it head-to-head -head with other uh, TLC products is we're using a 1% partition size versus 5% that we'd have on yes. a more... Very <laughs> gentle with the QLC drives. Yeah, you have to be careful. And you start to see that uh, difference when you uh, start looking at write performance where things get a little hairy for some products, but again, you're going to have... If you use it uh, with that in mind, with use it in some with those constraints in mind, the drive performs really well. I just, yeah. I'm not sure if it makes sense to use this as your boot drive yet, but it's getting pretty close. Yeah, in a budget system, you'd probably be fine. If you're going to install intensive apps here, you probably want something else, or put get one of each, throw one in each yeah, port. Yeah, our P620 and... has two slots. There you go. Uh, random read. Uh, Got a little sassy there, huh? Yeah, but that's just, you're going to find that in a QLC product. Yeah. Uh, and then on uh, random write, um, again, it offers kind of upper middle of the pack performance, although we're only testing. It's a small pack. <laughs> yes, it's a very small pack. Uh, it topped out around quarter million IOPS for 4K random write. It's a pretty strong performer. All right. And so switching to the Pro then, we've... Uh, tidied this chart up to include the MP600 Pro, the SN850, the usually class leading, though not represented here, Samsung 980 Pro, uh, the latest from XPG, and uh, Sabrin as well. Yeah, it offers really strong performance. It just it was second only to the uh, SN850, and just shy of uh, five gigs a second. And depending on the benchmark of choice or single versus multi-thread, you you will see a, probably stronger uh, read speeds in a um, high Q depth uh, single thread uh, workload. But this is more of a um, uh, heavier workload that uh, we try and shake these drives out with. Well, the sequential read, though, too, if you're thinking about loading apps, I mean, it, your app may not be 64K, but this is somewhat representative of, of what you would expect. When people say, can I feel the difference, these types of activities are really where this would stand out over even a Gen 3 drive or, oh, or prior SSD. So as we look at uh, the sequential write performance, this is one area where uh, the Samsung drives performs really well. Uh, but with that in mind, the uh, Corsair product, it's, it comes in kind of middle of the pack range. Random read, this is one area where the, uh, it's kind of strange. You look at the- I love um, this chart. The SN850, 
it has the higher top end performance, but it's a uh, it has a much higher latency profile at the lower uh, uh, workload ranges. So this is a that drive would be an interesting one to talk feeling difference because at more usable ranges it's kind of a higher latency, but it does top out at a higher performance level. Uh, the Corsair came in towards the uh, kind of the back end of the pack uh, on peak performance, topping around 300,000 IOPS, but overall does pretty well. Okay. And then random right, again, middle of the pack. And this one is just, it's almost like it's not fair comparing to the Samsung <laughs> products just with how well they do. You're talking about 200,000 uh, IOPS versus uh, north of 400,000 IOPS on the Samsung. But that is a difference just with how the market shakes out. Right. So overall, um, pretty good performance, not leading, but not bad. So really in that sort of acceptable range, I would think. Yeah, and then in, even in our, um, uh, we ran our SQL Server benchmark, for example, which you can see in our full review, that uh, it works pretty well in a test dev environment. Mm -hmm. I mean, it offers pretty strong performance across the board. Yeah, so it's overall an interesting uh, addition to the family, and we're excited to see Corsair doing more here, developing uh, a portfolio of SSDs. And if you're a Corsair fan, if you're using their products, and we know a lot of you are, throughout your case in a PC build, and you want to be brand loyal, you're not going to hurt yourself by going with these drives. Now, if you really want the highest end, best all arounder, then I guess we still have to lean towards the Samsung. But this isn't going to be a, uh, a, a bad choice. It won't disrespect your build. And, and if you complement um, both TLC and QLC drives together, you can do some really neat things. And if you need more storage, you can always toss in you know, like a card like this into your system and add third or fourth uh, drive if you want to. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so overall, nice nice offering. Good to see it. Uh, good momentum out of Corsair. And we're looking forward to what's next. We did uh, omit the part where we go through and show you the, the toolbox management software. That one is still a bit of a, a black eye yeah. uh, for these guys. They need to work on that uh, for firmware update management and drive management and that sort of thing. So we will not uh, do that here as well. But, uh, you know, like we said, if you look at the drive, its performance profile and cost profile, it's, uh, it's pretty reasonable and we're uh, optimistic about uh, the direction Corsair is heading. Thanks for tuning in.